My friends, I am excited to bring to you this text from Exodus 25. After being away for a couple of weeks, it's always good to be back, um, back with you again. Although, as I said this morning, um, I'm a little nervous. Uh, being away on vacation just has a way of, oh man, the next time I'm, I'm up doing this, Yikes, <laughs> that's the way I wake up on Sunday morning when i am been away for vacation, come back. Uh, but I'm glad to be here with this great text and these great words from God. Uh, we're going to look at them in just a few minutes. I want to first tell you about uh, something Connie and I saw when we were in Miami a couple of weeks ago. We just had dinner, we're out for an evening walk, and we come across a building that looks kind of like a church. So we wander up to the, the front door, I'm, I guess I'm... Kind of strange that way. I like churches, just different churches, seeing what they're doing, you know. So I peek into the windows, and we look at the bulletin board next to the main entrance, and there's all kinds of announcements and so. And then the door opens, and a young man comes out with, uh, with this. It's a bulletin, hands it to us, and says, Welcome, glad you're here. If you have any questions, let me know, and this will tell you a little bit about what we're all about. And uh, here's the first page of the bulletin. Energize your life. Uh, it calls us to energize you, renew yourself. And then it identifies a few of the seminars coming up. There's an energy medicine workshop on March the 5th. Uh, back on February 7th, there was a reconnective healing seminar. Um, last week's Sunday, the third one that you see there, the third picture, manifest the life of your dreams. And on the very corner, maybe you can't quite see it, but there's the name of the congregation. It's Unity on the Bay. One of the pages, uh, actually the back side, tells a little bit about Sunday celebrations. They are at 9 in the morning and 11 in the morning. And you might wonder what kind of speakers would come to a church like Unity on the Bay. And uh, here's one. His name is Panash Desai. And um, he's been named a new thought leader by Oprah. And uh, the title of the speech that he wants to bring uh, in March is From Unachievable to Unbelievable, Accessing Your Vibrational awesomeness. Now, I, <laughs> next speaker, uh, we'll just go right on. Um, <laughs> Mystical Minds, there's four classes, Chris Jackson. You know, and I, I, bring this, I bring this up to you, my friends, because I don't necessarily want us to, I mean, we can chuckle and so, that's fine, but I want you to get a sense for this congregation in Miami, Unity on the Bay, and they join us in this great truth, okay? They join us, they are with us in this great truth that human beings are deeply spiritual beings. That the most important part of who we are is something science cannot touch. We're spiritual beings. But the challenge, the difficulty, the problem at Unity on the Bay is that they are trying to do that without any reference to God, without any connection to Him, without uh, attributing to Him that He is the source of life. It's like spiritual self-help. It's find the answers within yourselves. And honestly, it's Adam and Eve all over again. We can do life all by ourselves, God. We don't really need you. And there are expressions of this kind of thinking all throughout our culture today. Donald Trump's nominal Christianity, claiming to be a Christian, and yet his life bears no evidence whatsoever that he is a follower of Jesus Christ. The therapeutic deism of the millennial generation, all those born from the early 80s to the early 2000s, where yes, there is a God, but once he created the universe, he just kind of left and he comes back into the creation whenever we're in trouble and we pray for his help. He's more than happy to come back, but then he just takes off again. And his goal for us as human beings is to be nice to people. And uh, if you're nice to people, that's how you get into heaven. And then there's just the regular old atheism that's been around for a very, very long time. Although in these days, you might notice, if you ever do some traveling on the internet, looking up atheism, there's just a new brashness, a new stridency, a new, a new boldness to the atheists today. And you'll hear about the flying spaghetti monster 
the atheist's mockery of the God that you and I serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All kinds of attempts to do life without God. And even in the lives of people like you and me, there are ways that we find, right, to do life without God. We go on vacation and forget to bring God with us. Or we make decisions, big life decisions, and neglect to ask God to join us and lead us and guide us in the making of those decisions. Or we carry on our lives throughout the week and neglect to do the chair time that is so important for followers of Jesus Christ, to do that regularly as a way to center ourselves on Jesus and his strength rather than our own puny resources. There's all kinds of ways that we attempt to, to do life without God. Well, let's go to the very beginning. And you'll all recognize this graphic that I've got on now. It's the six symbols that summarize the whole story of creation, from creation itself to the fall, to the promise that God made to restore creation, carried along by a people, the people of Israel. And the cross there in the center, the beginning of God's fulfillment of that promise to put creation back together. And then the horizontal arrow where God continues to send his promise to his world through a people, now the church. And then finally another downward arrow where at the end of time, and Revelation tells the story, creation will be regained and restored when God comes down again to make all things beautiful. In the very, very beginning of the story that the Bible tells, God creates. What is the very first thing that he brings to this, this chaos, this void, this darkness? What is the very first thing that God creates? Light. Let there be light. And there was. A symbol of everything that God was going to do in the subsequent days and eons of creation by bringing life into being. Light is a representative of life and of God. Adam and Eve, of course, brought darkness back to creation, represented by the cross up there. They brought darkness back to creation, kind of re-sending it into the chaos that was before God brought his order. Their son Cain kills their son Abel. God looks at all of humanity and is so grieved by the evil that's infected every life that he regrets creating humankind. A number of humans in a certain location build a tower, the Tower of Babel, as a way to proclaim that they are the gods of their own universe, the masters of their own destiny. Darkness once again reigns over all the earth, and not even a flood that God sends can bring creation, the restoration that it needs, the light that it needs. Darkness comes over not just the surface of the deep, as was the case before creation, but now after the fall. So God chooses to work through one man, Abram, and his descendants, the people of Israel. And they're going to be a light to the nations. And, and God chooses to represent himself again and again and again as he's preparing these people as light. In uh, Genesis 15, there's this interesting conversation going on between God and Abram, the man he's going to work through. And he symbolizes himself as a burning pot of coals, burning hot coals that give light to all of the area, including the animals that have been killed and then, and then split in half and laying on the ground. And God is saying to Abram, I symbolize myself for you, Abram, through this light, and may it be to me, as it has been done to these animals, if I'm not faithful to you and the promises that I've made to you. God symbols him, uh, pictures himself as light. A little bit later on, as the Israelites are languishing in Egypt, as Abram's descendants are slaves to the Pharaoh, God pictures himself as light again when he calls Moses now, in Exodus 3, out of a burning bush, another symbol of light. When Israel begins to make its way out of Egypt towards the wilderness and Mount Sinai and the promised land later on, in Exodus 13, God says, I'm going to lead you through a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. 
light. And then we get to Mount Sinai, boot camp for the mission of being in the promised land and being a light to the nations. This is where God's going to train his people, Israel. And he says, I'm going to put myself right in the middle of you at the tabernacle. And he, he creates this way of, an, of living right in the midst of his people. The tabernacle, a place for God to meet with sinful people and not have them be burned alive by his holiness. And in the middle of that tabernacle is a golden lampstand. The item of furniture that we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about and thinking about. Let's do that now, in fact. Let's go to Exodus 25, verses 31 to 40, and just learn a little bit about what this symbol is like that God invents to picture himself for his people. He says to Moses there in verse 31, after he's talked about the Ark of the Covenant and the table of showbread, make a lamp of pure gold, hammer out its base and shaft, and make its flower-like cups and buds and blossoms of one piece with them. So this whole thing, this complex piece of furniture with its seven branches, is going to be hammered into place so that it looks like one item of solid gold. Not a bunch of pieces of gold, but one. To picture the fact that God is one. Verse 32, six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three from one side, three from the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch, three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair, six branches in all. The buds and branches shall all be of one piece with the lampstand, hammered out of pure gold. And then make it seven lamps and set them up on it so that they light the space in front of it. Its wick trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. The talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Seven lamps, seven the number of completion. Highly decorated, absolutely beautiful, as God is beautiful. One piece, as God is one. This is a symbol of the life, the faithfulness, the direction, the protection that God brings to his people. And as if you were a priest back in the day, walking into the tabernacle, You'd go past the altar of sacrifice that Pastor Ed talked about a couple of weeks ago. You'd come to the bronze laver that Pastor Ed talked about last week, and you would wash before entering the tabernacle itself. You'd make your way into the holy place, this room of about 45 feet long by 15 feet wide, and you'd see on your left the golden lampstand that we've just described and read about. You'd see on your right the table of showbread that we'll talk about next week, and you'll see across the room from you the, the altar of incense. We'll talk about it in a couple of weeks. So you'd see this lampstand, and as a priest, you'd go there in the evening, at the time of the evening sacrifice, and you'd light all seven lamps, and they would burn all night long, illuminating the entire room so that you could do what needs to be done. And you would see the beautiful gold of this lampstand and the beautiful wood overlaid with gold of the bread and the altar of incense and all of these places and pieces of religious furniture. The next morning, you'd go back into the holy place and you would trim the wicks. You'd fill the bowls with the purest of olive oil. The purer the oil, the brighter the flame. So the lampstand was prepared for the next night worth of burning and illuminating this holy place. Again, a symbol of all that God brings to his people, his faithfulness, his love, his protection, all of the things that God gives, all the things that God does to equip his people to be a light for the nations. Well, how well do they do, the Israelites, at being a light for the nations? How well do they fulfill what God is talking about here in the lampstand, being a light for his people so that they can be a light for the nations? Well, they do terribly. It's not that they stop being religious, it's that they find other things to worship. 
Baal, Asherah, Molech, all these gods of the nations around them, they find substitutes for the true God. It's like the folks at Unity on the Bay, this congregation whose building we came up to last week, Connie and I, worshiping everything other than God. In their case, their own kind of spirit, their own kind of energy, and the way in which their spirit interacts with all the other spirits of all other things. The people of Israel worship Baal, Asher, and Molech. They went dark, so to speak, by rejecting God, and the nations around them no longer had a way into the light. Well, friends, if a flood won't bring lasting cleansing, and if a people won't bring lasting light, then what is God to do to restore his broken creation? What is the the instrument that he's going to use to finally accomplish what he promised he would accomplish just after the fall, bringing creation back. Read along with me in your minds these words from John chapter 1, where we right away are reminded of creation in this opening set of words for this gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And now John is commenting on not creation any longer, but on what the light is doing now. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A few verses later, um, maybe I won't get to John 8 just yet, but a few verses later in verse 14, John says, this word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So interesting in that little verse there, John 1 verse 14, the, the word that's translated became flesh and made his dwelling among us, it's the word tabernacled. The word this eternal power tabernacled. Does that remind you of anything? It reminds everybody who reads John 1 verse 14 of the way that God said, I'm going to live with my people, my unholy people. I'm going to live with them in a way that blesses them. Well, who is this that is the word who tabernacles among God's people? Now we get to John 8. I want you to picture Jesus standing in the temple in Jerusalem. It's no longer the tabernacle, this tent that was moving along with the Israelites. Now it's a temple, not Solomon's temple that was destroyed. Now it's the temple built by King Herod for the Jews, a mammoth edifice. The temple is surrounded by an inner court, the court of women, and then by an outer court, the court of Gentiles. And in each of the corners of the court of women is a is a pillar standing 75 feet tall. It's a ladder next to each one. The ladder was used by four young men to bring 10 gallons of olive oil to the top of that pillar every morning so that in the evening, those 10 gallons would feed these immense flames that would illumine the entire temple complex and the whole city of Jerusalem. This was blazing, burning light there in the feast of tabernacles that lasted for eight days. Blazing light. It's in this setting that Jesus says these words. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light of life. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Picture Jesus as the fulfillment of the tabernacle lampstand and the smoking fire pot that makes its way through the animal carcasses in in Genesis 15 and the the pillar of fire of Exodus chapter 3 and the burning bush of Exodus 15. Uh, 13, in the burning bush of Exodus chapter 3, every time you see light in the Old Testament, especially the lampstand that we've just looked at from Exodus 25, every time 
you are seeing an advanced presentation of what Jesus himself is and does. Like all of these symbols are pointing to Jesus Christ, who, as he says here in John chapter 8, is the light of the world. And maybe you can picture Jesus bringing new life to Matthew and Zacchaeus, these tax collectors whose lives had been filled with darkness, serving the God of Rome and money. Jesus enters their lives, just turns things upside down, leads them out of that brokenness and towards himself. Matthew becomes the writer of the gospel that we have here in our Bibles. Zacchaeus becomes a a benefactor for his community. Picture Jesus giving life and light to the man living among the tombs in the Decapolis and Mary Magdalene, these two people who were possessed by demons. And the gospel writers show us these pictures to see Have us see Jesus bringing light into darkness. Picture Jesus bringing light to the sinful women of Luke 7 and John 12, prostitutes. And to Lazarus, dead in the tomb. And the ten lepers, ready to be dead in the tomb. Picture Jesus bringing light into these lives, one after another, as he ministers in Galilee and Jerusalem for three years, Picture Jesus bringing God's faithfulness to little children and their mothers. To the thief on the cross. To doubting Thomas. And to Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Instead of, Peter, I can't believe you're here with us. What are you doing here? It's, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Continue to do the work that I've called you to do, Peter. This is light flooding in to Peter's life. Picture Jesus bringing God's protection to all sinners by dying on the cross as our substitute before God's judgment and taking us off the train bound for eternal destruction and putting us onto a different train, the train bound for the new creation where all of God's will will fully illumine all of life all the time. Picture Jesus rising from the dead and starting a new pattern for this world that's so broken and so dark, where life and light comes out of darkness, where life comes out of death. Picture God in the form of Jesus Christ shining into your soul and illuminating every corner every nook and cranny of the place. Bringing to light things that you'd rather keep dark. Things you've never told anybody about. Picture Jesus shining himself into those places. Illuminating those places with his grace. Making clear to you that you do not need to fear this light. It will not be overcome by darkness, but will overcome all darkness. And all the brokenness that you find in your life, the stuff that you've been trying to forget about as you kind of make your way through work, leisure, home life, or whatever, all these things that you thought were untouchable by the light, Jesus shines his light into and begins to change and transform and heal. Picture Jesus at your side as you are in the chair every morning or maybe every evening, whenever that time is in your day giving light to you as you listen to him speak. And picture Jesus shining his light into the world through the church. Picture John Paul II speaking truth to the communist leaders of the Soviet Union three decades ago and giving hope to all those shackled under the tyranny of that union from Yugoslavia to Romania to his own homeland and Poland, giving courage to them to rebel against that tyrannical government. Picture Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa speaking truth and light to the apartheid regime and leading people to sense that there is a way out of this despicable separation between blacks and whites. There's a way for the church to speak truth and love and grace and reconciliation. Picture the church in America 200 years ago establishing colleges and hospitals in all kinds of cities across the nation under the conviction that God is a God of healing and a God of learning, training his followers to bless their nation with what they've learned about him and their world. 
Picture 87 young lives at West Elementary School. Lives who've got all kinds of little and big brokennesses within them. All kinds of darknesses clouding out real life. And there comes an adult from Fairway Christian Reformed Church to send love into their lives for an hour every single week. Jesus shining his light. Picture Jim Vandermeer and Ruth Feenstra giving people who wrestle with depression an opportunity to share their struggles with one another and their victories here on our campus, in our church. Picture all kinds of people at Fairway ministering and serving, Jackie and Cheyenne Voss and the DeVray family loving on orphans in a third world country. Picture the teachers of our church pouring not just information into heads, but by their character and their love pouring Jesus Christ into their classrooms and into the lives of the students that are in those classrooms, whether they're Christian school teachers or public school teachers, finding ways to, to bring the love and the light of God into the lives of these students. Picture that. Picture engineers in our church celebrating the laws of physics and chemistry, laws that God created, celebrating those laws by using them to solve problems and make people's lives better. Picture the nurses of our church treating patients as whole people who don't just need physical assistance and healing, but who need to have their dignity affirmed, the dignity that God first planted in those lives, needing to have that affirmed in a setting in which it's almost calculated to rob you of your dignity. Picture the CPAs of our church. You guys are plenty busy these days. Picture the CPAs of our church crunching numbers for people and finding ways to listen for and, and express and articulate the stories that lie behind those numbers and help people understand what those stories mean. And maybe even find ways to, to help folks understand how to align up those stories with the story that God is telling. Picture Jesus shining into the world through his followers. They are called by his name to shine his light. They, they are the lampstands now. Listen to this word from the last book of the Bible. John's wild, God-given dream called Revelation. He sees a city coming down out of heaven from God at the end of time. This city is the home to all of the people of God. And this is how John describes that city. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, Jesus, are its temple. And the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb, Jesus, is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. There will be no night there. When God said at the very beginning, let there be light, he meant it. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, light of the world, shine on us. Lord Jesus, light of the world, through your death in our place, shine on us. Lord Jesus, through your resurrection, beginning a new day for this broken place, Shine on us. Lord Jesus, as you enter us by your Spirit and lead us to illumine the corners of the world in which we live, shine through us. <coughs> Lord Jesus, when you return, the city is, doesn't need the sun, the moon, or the stars because you are here. Shine on us. We 
we pray in your precious, precious name. Amen.